So I was a little bit surprised uh, to get Barry's email uh, asking if I would like to speak at this festival because I never thought I'd have the opportunity to speak at an arts festival. So that's my long-winded way of saying is this is a new audience for me. And initially I thought, okay, well, this is great. I have this material I've been presenting to all sorts of different audiences. Now I can present it to yet another audience. And um, I thought that would be the sort of the extent of the newness of it. Uh, but something interesting has happened in uh, the presentations that I caught yesterday and, and those today is that typically at a conference, I'm, uh, I'm desperately trying to remember parts of the previous presentation so that I can try to make my material relevant and reference back to it. And I found the presentations that I've seen here actually changing my talk in my head. And so the, the images are fixed because they're in a PowerPoint, but some of the language around them is going to change by virtue of what I've already heard here today. Uh, so, I, my closest experience to this would have been my first presentation at Colorado Arts Association in Dallas back in 2007 or something like that. And uh, interesting experience there was that I, I it, was, it was a panel on, on looting of art, uh, primarily looking at uh, art looted during World War II. And I thought, great, this is an opportunity to um, start presenting my material. And I was very excited. And then at the last moment, uh, College Arts Association is a huge conference, if you don't know. And uh, Yoko Ono made a, made a surprise visit and scheduled a talk at the same time that my panel was supposed to take place. So I don't know whether the sparse audience was a result of that or just the newness of the concept, but in any case, I, I'm glad to see such a full room here today. All right, I'm going to be speaking about uh, cultural security, or at least what I call cultural security. So one of my um, objectives is to give you a sense of what is meant by that in general and what I mean by it, and then how it relates to uh, the, the theme that, that Barry presented, um, and then uh, talk about what technology can do, not only to inform us about cultural security in the present, but how it can add maybe a predictive aspect to it. All right, what is cultural security? Okay, it's a phrase. It, it, I didn't make it up. Um, it, I, although I did start using it before I knew about other references to it, but when I used the, uh, the Google Ngram viewer, I realized that uh, it's, it's been used before, and so it's, uh, it looks like it started maybe in the 1930s, and, um, and then continued uh, to have some popularity but then dropped off a little bit in the 1950s, and then all of a sudden sprung back to life, and as you can see, the curve uh, going pretty steadily upwards. And what's interesting about this curve to me, and, and I haven't studied this in depth, but in 1954, there was a, a, a landmark uh, international convention was passed called the, uh, the Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property During Armed Conflict, and it was motivated by the large-scale destruction and looting that occurred during World War II. And if you look at this graph, it appears as though ever since that time point, the, uh, the phrase has, has increasingly been used uh, with more frequency uh, across literature. So in what context is cultural security used? So there's this notion that it's, it's about protecting uh, indigenous people's culture. Um, and then there's another uh, notion that it's, uh, it's used to protect what's, what's thought of as being national culture. And in fact, uh, China in their recent national security law has a section on cultural security. And it's interesting there um, how, how that's used in political rhetoric um, and, it, and how it can be abused in some ways as well. Um, I, look at, I look at it in a very international sense and thinking about what is the relationship between culture and international affairs or more specifically international security. So, I guess one answer to the question is what is cultural security? It's, it depends on perspective. You can think of it as a nation being concerned about the culture of indigenous peoples and trying to um, protect as much as possible, preserve that, that indigenous culture from, uh, from the influences of an industrialized society. Uh, national uh, cultural security can be thought of in terms of a nation trying to uh, mediate the effects of, uh, of, of international influence on 
on that culture. And what, what are these influences? Well, I'm going to very broadly refer to them in terms of politics, economics, and security. And uh, what I'm gonna be speaking about today is the way in which these three dimensions or these three uh, sort of operators um, in, in world power, uh, what role culture plays in each one of them. So I, I, I should, I, I'm gonna take a step back here and as Barry already mentioned, uh, my background isn't actually in, it's not in art, art history, it's not in political science, it's not in security studies. Um, my background is in software engineering and, and neuroscience. And uh, ironically, even though this conference is about looking at technology in relationship to art, I actually started looking at this um, to get away from technology. And, um, and, and here's what happened. So as a, as a scientist, I tend to look at things that I can measure. So I thought, okay, well, culture is pretty amorphous in some ways. What, what is tangible, what can be measured? So I quickly gravitated towards cultural property as a representation of culture. And so uh, the images that I, that I have up on the screen are, um, are representations of those three dimensions that I mentioned and the way in which cultural property plays a role in each, in each one of them. So of course there's the global art market and what's interesting about this graphic is that it shows China as having a larger percentage of the global art market than either the United States or the United Kingdom. Um, I, I, took, I took these numbers in 2011, it might have changed since, but the point is that, that, that China has emerged as a, as a very significant component in the art market, and not only that, when you look at the relationship of, of their percentage relative to their GDP, it becomes even more striking. Uh, the, the figure to the right of that is an image of Cezanne's The Card Players, and not only does the image of poker playing um, uh, have some, some relationship or some similarities to international politics or foreign relations. But this, this painting also set a world record being purchased for $250 million by the royal family of Qatar. So here you have an Arab nation buying a Western work of art and paying a premium for it, which is also interesting from an international relations standpoint. And the lower image um, represents uh, the security aspect of international affairs. Uh, it's an image, some of you may be familiar with it, uh, it shows the demolition of one of the giant statues of Buddha in the Bamiyan Valley of, of Afghanistan by the Taliban in 2001. And so what's, what's interesting about this um, tragic event is that it was an act of terror, but there wasn't any intent for loss of life. I, I'm not sure if anybody was hurt in the process of, of uh, blowing up the Buddhas, but I, I, don't, I don't think that that, are, that was the intent. It was purely symbolic to, um, to draw attention to their cause. So within, within the three dimensions of, of economics, politics, and, and security, uh, cultural property is represented by the art market. Uh, cultural property is what I refer to um, art in, in the world of, of political science. And then uh, art crime is, is, is an example of, of the role that uh, culture plays in, in security. So I looked at each one of these from a historical standpoint and then also looking forward um, from 2001 onward, which is when I started doing this research. And I, I didn't only look at, at the role um, that culture plays in security uh, with e within each one of these dimensions in isolation, I also looked at how there's an interaction between them. So for example, as, as the value of art increases in the art market, it, it perhaps takes on greater political significance or there's more interested from a political standpoint. Um, also, as artworks become more, more valuable financially, it, it, it motivates art crime. Uh, correspondingly, as, as artworks take on political significance, it might increase their market value, and it makes, um, it makes uh, monuments and so forth uh, more attractive as targets uh, for political destruction or political violence. And, and correspondingly, forgeries and, and um, art can influence the art market and vandalism can motivate the, uh, um, the development of, of uh, protocols for the protection of, of art. So all of these th three um, dimensions interact and have has in fact increased over the last 15 years uh, to integrate them even more. So I'm going to uh, very quickly uh, go through um, sort of the telltale signs that each one of these has, has increased uh, um, in, in magnitude, say, since World War II. Um, I already I give you some, some insight into the relative market values. Uh, so the, the, the art market itself has developed dramatically since World War II, and one way of, of, um, 
of indicating that is, is just by the, the, the peak prices that are paid for artworks. So the two images that are shown here, the one on the left is, uh, I think it's number five by Jackson Pollock, and it sold in 2006 for $140 million for a single painting. And that set the record at the time, and it, and it, and it eclipsed the previous record. And then I already mentioned that um, uh, shortly after that, uh, the, this, the, the image on the right was purchased for $250 million. But, um, but those are prices simply for private sales um, at auction, which tend to be lower. Uh, records are also being set. The image on the left is by Picasso, and it previously held the record uh, ha as having broken the $100 million mark. Uh, the image on the right is Edvard Munch's The Scream, uh, which uh, sold, I think it was in, in 2000, I wanna say 2013, uh, for, um, for $120 million. So it's, uh, it clearly, um, the, the art market has been expanding uh, quite a bit. But this isn't just the case in Western art. Uh, looking at, at artworks developed by Chinese artists, uh, in fact, contemporaries of Picasso, um, not only have been uh, you know, increasing their, their presence in the art market, but uh, in 2011, the artist depicted here, who's a contemporary Picasso, uh, the, the sale of his works actually surpassed that of, of Picasso. In other words, the turnover, the dollar amount of the turnover was greater than that for Picasso. And Picasso's works had been held as sort of a, a benchmark for, for um, the value of artworks. And so perhaps that gives Picasso a little bit, uh, a little bit concern here. Um, all right, so another example of, of the way in which um, uh, so the art market has been developing is by comparing it to um, uh, typical investment instruments. So here, uh, this graph shows that, and this is based on the My Moses Index that, that carefully tracks, um, it's, it's almost like a Standard & Poor's 500 of, of um, well-known artworks so it can compare resale value of the artworks. And here it shows that, um, that the, the My Moses Index seems to track the Standard & Poor's uh, 500 Index quite well. Um, and in fact, post-war art would, would represent by the blue line, it uh, looks like it might even be doing a little bit better than the Standard & Poor's 500 index. Uh, so the, the popularity of art as, as an investment and not just a matter of connoisseurship ha is, is demonstrated by indices that, that look at individual um, artists such as Damien Hirst and tracks their performance relative to the Standard & Poor's 500 index. So moving on to political science, I already um, gave you some background on that, on that painting, but moving away from, from the art market, uh, one way in which uh, art has become, has developed a great deal of practical value uh, in foreign relations is the restitution of, of objects. And so um, in, in 2005, 2006, there were landmark cases where Italy and Greece challenged uh, prominent museums in the United States, uh, whether or not the objects or the, the, um, the antiquities in their possession uh, had a legitimate provenance. And uh, this, this gold funerary wreath represented here was returned by the Getty um, to, uh, to Italy in, in 2006, the uh, Euphronius Crater from the Met uh, to Italy as well. Other museums, the Cleveland Museum of Art um, was uh, uh, coalesced and returned objects because the, it was, the provenances were in question. And it's not just restricted to movable um, objects. There's, this is a, an image of the Axum obelisk from Ethiopia, which was removed by Italy, I believe in the 1930s. And after World War II, uh, Italy signed an agreement to return the obelisk in 1947. Didn't get around to it until 2003, which, which the timing is pretty interesting there. So they returned this in 2003, and in 2005 and 2006, they asked for things to, to come back. <laughs> So you can, you can, you're getting a sense of the political nature of this. Um, it isn't, uh, returns aren't just uh, based on whether or not the, the provenance is in question. This is an image of Machu Picchu in Peru uh, where artifacts were excavated legally between an agreement uh, between uh, archeologists from the United States and, and Peruvian archeologists. And as part of the agreement, some of the uh, um, artifacts went back to and ended up in the Peabody Museum at Yale. This was at the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, for a while, Peru had been lobbying for the return of the objects and in 2010 succeeded in, in, uh, in, in achieving a memorandum of understanding for the objects to come back. Um, it isn't necessarily objects that are simply within the confines of a nation's border. 
Uh, this, this image is a Cycladic figure that was, Turkey was laying claim to this, to ha having it returned. I think it was from the Cleveland Museum of Art, simply because it was discovered somewhere in, within, the, within the reach of the Ottoman Empire, not necessarily where Turkey is today. Uh, it, it isn't restricted to uh, items going um, from, from institutions back to nations. This is an image of one of the uh, paintings by Gustav Klimt that was returned from a national museum in Austria to a private individual in Los Angeles, California, Maria Altman, um, because it was, it was demonstrated the, uh, that the artworks were not necessarily acquired um, uh, legitimately. And then finally, uh, it's, it's not just uh, nations um, uh, asking for return from institutions or, or things or items going back to private individuals. Um, it's uh, auction houses as well. This is an image of a of a um, of a statue that was uh, was originally from Cambodia, and when the Cambodia when a Cambodian authority saw this on the cover of a Sotheby's auction catalog, they said, "Wait a second! I think that was taken from our country uh, illegally." And it turns out that um, uh, in the end, the, the, the Department of Justice and, and U.S. attorneys um, you know, co uh, cooperated with the Cambodian government to investigate the case, and the statue was, in fact, returned. So these, this, 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 this movement of, of, of wartime looting uh, or, or illicitly acquired objects returning to their um, countries of origin um, or simply because objects are, were originally from one place and, and the nation's saying this, this really belongs back to where it was, was created, um, that might inspire uh, other nations to pursue the same course of action. Um, the Benin bronzes may return to, uh, or some of them have returned to Nigeria and um, may continue to return. And then uh, what, what, what I haven't mentioned yet, what's, it's almost a, a metaphor for the question of restitution are the Parthenon marbles, which were taken at the, uh, which were removed from, from uh, the Parthenon in Athens um, at the beginning of the 1800s, and Greece has lobbied for the return uh, uh, of, of, these, of these artifacts to come back to Greece. And what's, what's interesting, it was always thought that if, if the, the so-called Elgin marbles were ever to return to Greece, it would have a domino effect, and then every, every item that was ever removed from a country under any circumstances would end up going back. And, but the British Museum is hanging tough. They still have the Elgin marbles. And it may turn out that the Elgin, Elgin marbles are, in fact, the last uh, item to ever go back. So now moving on to security. I already talked about this image a little bit. This took place in, in, uh, in Afghanistan in, in 2001. Uh, Iraq 2003, uh, looting that happened during, during and after, uh, in, the, in the chaos after conflict. This is an image, a satellite image of, of, uh, of looting occurring um, across uh, Iraq. Uh, there was a, a professor, uh, I think, uh, um, New York uh, University, Stony Brook, uh, that that had this idea that okay well if we if we look at time lapsed images uh, satellite images we can actually see where looting is happening and expanding over time so that was instrumental to, to realize what the problem was uh, and then uh, art crime has 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 been flourishing over the last decade and a half um, and it these um, it, when I say that I mean uh, so so fine works uh, are, are works of fine art being taken from museums and and uh, and private collections. Um, so what what these what these art crimes as in general that I'm calling them uh, has motivated uh, some response. So uh, for example, after uh, the the looting in Iraq in 2003, uh, the FBI formed the art crime team. Um, which was formed in part to retrieve some of the items that were, um, that were taken from, from Iraq uh, during that time. And, uh, and subsequently, uh, uh, the art crime team has, involved, has been involved in, in retrieving other objects, such as this painting. Uh, it was a collaboration with the um, uh, police in Madrid uh, to retrieve items that were stolen from a, um, from a residence. And uh, artworks are also found in conjunction with other major crimes. So for example, this image by Mitsu was, uh, was stolen from a, an estate in Ireland. It was discovered in, in, uh, in Istanbul, I believe, um, when there was a bust on, on, on a, on a heroin, heroin trade that was going down. And it was seen that this, it was realized this painting was being used as collateral in, in, the, in the drug deal. Um, so it's, it's pretty clear that, that there's, that, um, 
that art is no longer simply a victim of conflict. In other words, it isn't an afterthought. That, you know, conquest happens, looting and plunder happens after conquest. It's, it's much more tightly integrated with, uh, not only with armed conflict, but with, with, um, with crime. And so it doesn't, it isn't necessarily constricted to wartime. It's happening in peacetime as well. This integration of, 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 uh, of art crime with um, what we considered more, more serious crimes. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now, and I'll, I'll move on. So wh where does technology fit into all this? So again, as a scientist, I'm, 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 I'm all about data collection. And so one, one approach to understanding the art market better, um, so th the market for fine art, if you will, is, is tracked quite closely. And um, as I pointed out, there's indices that, that track the value of the artworks. Not so much for the antiquities market, and so this, this becomes a problem when when there's all this there's there's all this curiosity about, you know, whether or not uh, Daesh or the Islamic State is is using uh, the antiquities uh, market to finance their operations, and then there, there there are all sorts of wild estimates on what the size of the ant uh, the illicit antiquities market is. Well, I'm not sure that there's even a notion of what the licit market in antiquities is. So I, in 2009, I, I started looking at uh, data um, from Sotheby's, and this is what I came up with. And technology fits into this because I did some screenscaping on the, on the Sotheby's auction, um, auction sites to actually retrieve the data. And so the, the image on the upper left um, breaks down uh, uh, antiquities uh, into, into different categories. Uh, these are categories that, that um, Sotheby's provides, so it, it makes it easy to, to, to collect the data in that way. And uh, by looking at, at, at this type of an image, you can see a trend emerging. So what's interesting here is that, is that African tribal art has had the, uh, during, over that time period, had the, had the most steady increase and in fact surpassed um, all the other art, types of artworks in financial volume. Um, so that, that motivates a little bit closer inspection of it. Is it just the prices or is it the volume or what's going on? So a little bit closer analysis shows that it's, it's both, uh, represented by the red line. The size of the spheres are, is the volume of objects traded and the, and the, the height of the sphere along the y-axis is, is, the, is the price. So again, the trend persists. So let's look a little bit more closely at, at African tribal art. And so now breaking it down by different regions in Africa, um, you know, one, one stands out here in particular, and it's not the black line at the top, it's the, it's the gray dotted line that actually has an upturn between 2008 and 2009, which is when the economic crisis happened. Everything else went down, this one went up. Okay, well, it's interesting, let's look at that. So it turns out that that was um, for artworks in the category of what was from the Sahel, and then look, so looking at um, the different, uh, um, uh, the, the ethnicities of those, of those artworks. Uh, it turns out that artworks from Mali were, looked, looked like they were responsible for that spike. So this, this, this type of analysis, you know, using technology to enable it, can, uh, can give us a sense of what parts of the world are at risk of looting, perhaps. I mean, it's not going to definitively predict it, but it's, but it's one, uh, one way of looking at it. Okay, so now moving on to the political science or foreign relations um, aspect of how that, you know, what sort of quantitative analysis we can do there. I, I mentioned one of the conventions, which is the 1954 Hague Convention, and, um, and there's, there's a slew of other conventions, as you can see here, that have been, um, you know, ever since the mid-1800s, there have been all sorts of efforts to protect cultural heritage during armed conflict and during peacetime, such as the UNESCO Convention of 1970, to, um, to prevent the illicit transfer of cultural property. So uh, why does it make sense to look at these conventions? Because it makes sense to look at which nations are becoming states parties. So the graph on the top gives you a sense of participation um, it varies across nations. Some nations have participated in all the conventions, some, some of them in, in only a few of them. Um, and then starting to look at this more graphically, you can see uh, um, this is, this is an, so, so there's been pretty good um, participation in the 1954 Hague Convention, over 120 nations. Um, similarly, for the first and second protocols to that convention, and now looking at conventions that have to do with protection of cultural property, not necessarily related to armed conflict, um, that would be the 1970 UNESCO Convention, 
and the 1995 UNODROIT uh, Convention. And the, um, these have to do with uh, not only preventing the ILSA transfer, but also providing a, me a mechanism for, uh, or the means by which a, a nation can, um, can challenge the possession and, and, and achieve a retrieval of the, of the artifacts. Uh, looking at these in combination is interesting. So which countries have, have become states party to some and not to other? And, and for example, Afghanistan uh, stands out here as having, um, as having uh, take, participated in, in the conventions to protect the illicit transfer of cultural property, but not necessarily the uh, protection during, during armed conflict. This is an, ind an index I came up that uh, quantifies the partici participation of any one nation in these conventions, both looking at how many they have become a state party to and how quickly they became a start state party after the convention was established. And so these lines, um, basically the, the more quickly a line goes up from left to right, the stronger their participation. So you can see there's some variation in these. The United States is represented by the, the dark blue line on the bottom. So they're, um, and that was in part due to their very um, uh, sort of prolonged uh, becoming a state party to the 1954 Hay Convention, which was established in 1954. The United States became a state's party in 2009. Um, looking at different regions of the world gives you a sense of, of how, um, oops, of how, uh, of how actively nations are involved in, in, um, in the protection of cultural heritage during armed conflict. And again, the reason that's interesting is because it shows a crossover between art and, and, uh, and politics. Bilateral treaties are another uh, way in which art has become more integrated into foreign relations. Uh, these, these dots on, on the right there, they show you uh, the, the year in which a uh, bilateral treaty was established between the United States and another nation. Um, these are some of the nations with which, uh, whoops, excuse me, with, with which the United States has, has formed bilateral agreements. Um, I, I think there's, there's over 13 nations at this point. And then, um, and this shows you across time uh, when, the, when the bilateral treaties were established, uh, the dots um, between 2000 and 2005 that, that suggests that maybe it's interesting to look at what's going on there. That happened to be the year, as I mentioned earlier, where, where um, prominent uh, cultural institutions in the United States were being challenged for their possession of, of foreign cultural heritage. All right, so, um, and, then, and then lastly, uh, I, I, I said a moment ago, it's very challenging to, to know what's happening with the illicit trade in antiquities, and it's, and it's, it's difficult to get comprehensive numbers on the illicit trade, uh, such as it is. So I've, after looking at this, uh, thinking about all this for about 15 years, I, I decided to figure out well, what is it that we can measure. And so my most recent project is looking at repatriation cases. So these are cases in which uh, one nation will challenge the possession or ownership of, of a cultural artifact that's, that's in another nation, whether it's in a, in, in a museum or a private collection and make a case for the return of that artifact to the nation of origin. And uh, so the red, lines represent, the red line represents the number of cases that are, that are initiated within a particular year. So it, this, at least from the data I've collected so far, there's a pretty strong indication that there's, there's an increasing interest in, in, these, in, in, um, in initiating these cases. They're also being resolved as represented by the green line so that the number of, of, of unresolved cases in any one year is, is hovering at about 100. This is simply the data I've collected so far. Another way of looking at it is how long does it take for a case to be resolved? And this very complicated looking graph is basically saying as time goes on, the amount of time required to resolve a case is decreasing. So as the blue dots become more clustered, um, on the lower part of the graph to the right, it's an indication that cases that were formed uh, more recently are taking less time to resolve. Again, that, that, might, that suggests that there's, there's more attention being paid to this from a political standpoint. Um, in other words, a case that was initiated in, in the 1970s might have taken 35 years to resolve, and, and the machinery perhaps just wasn't there to see the case through. Perhaps there wasn't enough interest in, in doing it. Um, but that clearly that, that's changed over time. So w what are the nations that are doing, uh, that, that, are, that are asking for, or that are initiating cases for repatriation? 
Um, these are just some of the nations uh, that, that reached a threshold of, of at least four cases. And then uh, looking at some of the other information that's collected in the process of recording uh, the cases, under which circumstances did the artifact leave the, um, the nation? And then in combination with other so-called metadata, um, you can start to look at some interesting uh, trends that may be occurring. So I'm going to wrap this up with, um, with a little bit about neuroaesthetics. So uh, is, has anyone actually heard the term neuroaesthetics? All right. Um, so I became interested in, this when I was interested in this when I was finishing my graduate work in, in uh, visual neuroscience. And I was already feeling a need to take a break from the sciences, so I started thinking about, okay, well, what can neuroscience tell us about art? And I found out that I realized that there had already been some very interesting work that had been done on this by um, a professor by the name of Samir Zeki at University College London. And he very elegantly shows how, how experiments in neuroscience, particularly visual neuroscience, have, have verified the genius of artists in understanding how the brain works. So, so really briefly, I'll try to just explain the, um, what I mean by that. So, um, for example, an artistic technique such as representing a third dimension on a two-dimensional canvas is very much akin to the challenges that, that you and I have when we try to perceive depth because all the information that, we're, that, that comes into our eyes is compressed onto a two-dimensional retina. And then somehow our brain needs to extract, re-extract the third dimension from that. Well, the, um, the artists of the Renaissance, and perhaps part of that, they, the, the techniques of, um, of, uh, of obscuring one part of the image from another, foreshortening and perspective, uh, are in fact exactly the cues that the brain uses, or, or, or I should say that, um, um, uh, the, the branch of, of, of visual neuroscience called psychophysics um, discovered that those are in fact the, uh, the exact cues that the brain uses to reconstruct a third dimension. Chiaroscuro is an example of, of, of artists understanding the, um, uh, how well the brain is specialized to identify contrast. So, so by, by looking at the, um, the effects of light and shadow and how that how effectively that works in a painting, well, it turns out that our, their visual system is, is highly developed to, um, to identify the very smallest changes in contrast. The Impressionists uh, recognized um, that, that the information entering our eyes is not cleanly, um, is, not, is not clean, such as it is in our perception. It's actually quite chaotic. Uh, cubists were probing the question of what, by looking at an image, can we in fact see all sides of it? And, and this is something that our brain does very well. We can imagine what an object looks like um, around all sides, not just the side that we're looking at. Uh, so kinetic artists uh, strove to understand the aesthetic um, of motion itself. Uh, neuroscientists sub subsequently identify that, that as, as information enters your eye and before it's before perception is formed, there are actually discrete parts of the brain that are specialized to identify color, form, and motion. Uh, similarly, the, uh, the um, uh, color form artists uh, try to distinguish color from, from shape. And then uh, more recently, uh, contemporary artists are, are looking at perhaps more visceral responses to art, so, um, separating art from any sort of knowledge or cultural background getting at the fundamentals of vision, you know, perhaps playing on our emotions. And with that, I'm probably way over my time limit, so thank you.